Okay, so good afternoon and welcome to the Township's virtual open house regarding short-term rentals. Like I mentioned, my name's Lindsay Earle and I'm the Manager of Community and Development Services with the Township. I will be your chair for the meeting this afternoon. We also have staff in attendance, Mr. William Colossa, our CAO, Mr. Mark Tardiff, our Bylaw Enforcement Officer, as well as Ms. Sarah Ivins, our Township Planner, who is acting as the moderator. For the members of Council present, we welcome Councillor Van Vliet, Councillor Cridlin, Councillor Gilmore, and Mayor Gibson. Thank you all for attending. The purpose of this virtual open house meeting is to provide the public with information and receive comments, suggestions, and ideas as they pertain to the draft bylaw to regulate and license short-term rentals in the Township of Waynefleet. Other than the draft bylaw, which we will review, there are no recommendations provided by staff to council. Township Council will not be making any decisions at this meeting. A recommendation report will be prepared by staff and presented at subsequent meeting of Township Council following a full review of all public comments received. Please be advised that your comments provided today will become part of the public record. This meeting is being streamed live and recorded to be posted on the website for public viewing. Well, with that being said, I hope you're ready. I hope you're excited. Let's get started. Our agenda today includes the following, a review of short-term rentals, the township background, a review of the draft bylaw, and then we'll move to the public speakers. At the end, I will review the next steps and offer a closing. Short-term rentals. In Ontario, short-term rentals or home sharing is one of the fastest growing sectors in the economy, being driven by various online platforms that host listings, facilitate bookings and payments, such as Airbnb and VRBO. According to the Provincial Guide on Home Sharing, these online platforms are present in over 190 countries across the globe. This growth has resulted in a number of local municipalities in Niagara investigating the need for further regulation and or licensing systems to address short-term rentals and the direct effects that they have on the community that hosts such rentals. The term short-term rentals is generally used to describe a wide range of rentals that occur over a short period of time typically from one to three days or a week, but less than a month, usually within a residential dwelling unit, but they have to fall outside of traditional commercial accommodations such as hotels, motels, and bed and breakfasts. In the township of Waynefleet, short-term rentals are most frequently associated with cottage rentals. Other than B&Bs where the owner is present on the property, short-term rentals typically occur in one of the following formats. It's the operator's residence with no operator present. And that's typically when the operator rents the entire building or dwelling that's not being used at the, by the owner at that time. So that's known as your traditional cottage rental. I'm just gonna pause for one moment. I think there was a technical difficulty. Okay. Oh, I just need to hide the box. Sorry, guys. Maybe that's better. Okay. Uh, we were talking about the types of rental units. So the traditional cottage rental where the op it's the owner's uh, primary or secondary residence that they still use. The other option is that it's not the operator's residence and the operator's not present. So really sometimes property owners purchase a property with no intention of residing or using the property themselves and just rents it out for periods to generate income. Those uses often are referred to as ghost hotels where they can have you know, a significant turnover of guests. The exact number of short-term rental accommodations in Waynefleet is unknown. However, a review of the various online rental platforms identifies well in excess of 100 short-term rental properties in Waynefleet at any given time, with the majority of those accommodations along the Lake Erie shoreline. Short-term rentals can have both positive and negative effects on adjacent properties, neighborhoods, and the local economy. In general, the following potential negative impacts associated with short-term rentals is known to commonly occur. Environmental issues primarily related to the overloading of sewage disposal systems, 
Parking is often reported that a number of vehicles parking at short-term rental units exceed the number of vehicles that would normally be accommodated on a strictly residential property. Noise complaints are frequently cited as concerns associated with the short-term rentals. Our bylaw to regulate noise in the township is generally applicable to all properties within the township. Concerns that short-term rentals may not fully comply with the requirements of the building code or the fire code with safety in mind. Housing affordability. Often instances where the purchase of housing for only short-term rental use detracts from the available housing supply. Reducing the supply of housing can raise housing prices. Compatibility with neighboring uses. That's concerns raised about short-term rentals changing the character of neighborhoods by increasing the number of short-term guests and decreasing the number of long-term residents. And finally, unfair competition with traditional accommodation providers such as tourist establishments. Potential positive impacts for short-term rentals include short-term rentals providing an alternate form of accommodation for visitors from a more traditional accommodation, such as resorts, hotels, or motels. They have the ability to obtain additional rental income for some property owners that may offset the carrying costs of owning the properties. And finally, increasing the opportunity for visitors to the township benefits the entire tourism sector and local commercial operations. So how did we get here? At its meeting in August 4th, 2020, the Council of Township of Weanfleet enacted a motion that stated the growth of an unregulated sharing economy has required municipalities across Ontario and beyond to look at ways to address the challenges of short-term housing rentals, including attempting to balance and maintain affordable housing while protecting communities. Council then directed staff to investigate and report on the policy considerations of regulating short-term housing uses in the township. That included impacts on affordable housing, tourism, public safety, and challenges to existing regulations. When staff provided the detailed information and options for Council's considerations at the meeting of April 20th, 2021, Council made the decision that, by, that a bylaw to license and regulate short-term rentals in the township is the preferred option to address the concerns and directed staff to draft the bylaw. Staff has worked closely with the township solicitor through the process of drafting the bylaw. Along with all relevant township departments, they were consulted and have reviewed the proposed bylaw. Staff brought the draft bylaw forward for council's review and to initiate a public consultation process on October 26, 2021. Today's open house will allow staff and members of council to hear the public's comments, suggestions, and ideas. The commenting period to submit written comments will remain open until the end of the month, following which staff will complete a full review of all public comments received and make revisions to the draft bylaw as necessary before bringing it back for council's consideration. So the draft bylaw. The purpose of the draft bylaw is to license and regulate short-term rentals in the Township of Waynefleet. The key licensing regulations considered include the following. Definitions have been incorporated into the draft bylaw. For example, a short-term rental unit means all or part of a dwelling unit used to provide sleeping accommodations to one or more persons other than the owner for a period of more, not more than 30 consecutive days, during which the period that owner does not occupy the dwelling unit and in exchange for payment, but does not include things like bed and breakfast, boarding or rooming houses, hotels or motels. It includes prohibitions. The draft bylaw states that no person shall operate a short-term rental unit without holding a current and valid license. No short-term rental unit shall have an occupancy limit or be occupied by a total number of persons that exceed two people per bedroom and no short-term rental unit shall be operated for a total of more than 180 days within any calendar year. For administration, the bylaw will be administered by the license administrator who can issue licenses, impose terms and conditions on licenses, refuse to issue or renew licenses, and may conduct inspections of short-term rental units if required. For applications, the licensing bylaw will further allow the township to maintain a record with detailed information such as ownership, contact information, 
parking plans and more through the application for a new or renewal of a license. These applications include the requirement for the submission of the application form, fee, site plan, which includes the parking and refuse areas, floor plan, fire safety plan, fire safety inspection report, a drinking water report, a boil water advisory notice to be posted in the unit where applicable, a septic system inspection report, and insurance certificate. The draft bylaw for issuance of a license states that all licenses issued or renewed shall be valid for a period of two years from the date of issuance or renewal. For notice and appeal, an appeals committee is to be appointed by council to conduct hearings under the bylaw. An applicant or licensee who license has been refused, suspended or revoked may submit an application to the appeals committee for a review of the decision. The draft bylaw includes a demerit system where if at any time the license administrator determines that the operation of a short-term rental unit does not comply with the bylaw or other applicable laws, the license administrator shall impose demerit points in accordance with Schedule A of our bylaw. Demerit points shall remain in place for two years after the date of imposition. And finally, enforcement, offenses, and penalties. Those are under the, under the jurisdiction of the Administrative Monetary Penalties, or AMPS, for failures to comply with the bylaw. These fines are set out in Schedule B of the bylaw. So that concludes what I had to say as far as a review of the, of the draft bylaw that has been prepared. So now we can move to our public commenting portion of the meeting. I will briefly go over some ground rules for the speaker's direction. Speakers are on a time limit of five minutes each. Please do not single out specific properties. And if you are discussing issues and concerns, you can just limit it to your experience. It's our understanding that a number of speakers may share the same views. And in the essence of time, we do not need to repeat previous comments made by other speakers. However, feel free to acknowledge uh, the, the previous comments if you wish. Participants' videos and microphones shall remain off until they are called to speak. The moderator will call on participants one by one to provide comments. When your name is called, please turn your video and microphone on and state your full name and address prior to providing comments. Once your comments have been given, your video shall be turned off and your microphone muted. If you wish to speak a second time, you may select the raise hand function to notify the moderator that you wish to speak. The moderator will call upon you once all registered participants have had the opportunity to speak. Please lower your hand once you've spoken or if your question has been addressed. Again, please note that your comments provided will become part of the public record. This meeting is being streamed live and recorded to be posted on the website for public viewing. With that, I will ask the moderator to please call the first speaker. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, our first speaker is Amanda Marshall. Hey, good afternoon. My name is Amanda Marshall and I live at 3504 East Main Street in Stevensville. I own and operate Holiday Homes Property Management, and we manage short-term rentals in the Niagara region, primarily in Fort Erie, Waynefleet, and Port Colborne. Our company is part of the Ontario Cottage Rental Managers Association, and I also head up the Fort Erie Short-Term Rental Association. As a short-term rental operator, we welcome regulations. However, we believe they should be reasonable, easy to follow, and cost-efficient. There are a few areas of the proposed bylaw of concern. Uh, the first being the maximum occupancy. Um, the, just to give you some background, the Fort, uh, the Fort Erie Short-Term Rental Association conducted a study last summer in 2021 and found the average group size to be 4.6 people. While the study was done in Fort Erie, the area is very similar to Wayne's, Wayne Fleet and is suggestive of the types of families that would be staying in short-term rentals in the area. Limiting to two bedrooms, two persons per bedroom will impact families looking for affordable vacations. We would suggest two persons per bedroom plus a maximum of two additional people. For example, a two bedroom property would be allowed to have six people maximum and so on. In terms of the limiting to the 180 day maximum, also in our study, we found 75% of people stayed three to seven nights, 
14% stayed one to two nights, and 11 stayed more than seven nights. While the majority of reservations are for the summer months comprising from June to September, short-term rentals are also used to house people who live in trailer parks during the summer and need accommodation for the winter or part of the winter. Short-term rentals are also used to house those displaced due to reservations, dis disasters like fires, floods, or between homes because their closing costs don't match up. Limiting short-term rentals to 180 days maximum will make it challenging to house these types of people. In terms of the time limits, the timelines for inspections, the draft bylaw allows for fire inspection reports to be dated up to 60 days before um, the application, whereas water and building reports are required 30 days before. For simplicity, simplicity's sake and ease of memory, I would suggest all inspection documentation be required up to the same time period. My only other comments about the time limits is that trying to book and find people to inspect may be challenging. So I'd hate to find that an owner has to start all over again, just because one or two of the inspections don't meet the, six, the strict 60 day time limit. Why have these particular timelines been chosen? Is it possible to change it to timelines to six months prior to the application date instead? Uh, in terms of the signage within one meter under 12.1 B and D, as long as the license and fire plan are displayed prominently, why would the one meter language be required? If an inspection did take place and the license was found to be one meter and one centimeter away, would the owner be subject to a fine? I would suggest a reference to one meter be removed and just uh, use the language of a prominently displayed. In terms of the boil water advisory signage, in order to get a license, the owner must submit documentation that their water is safe. So with that in mind, I'm not understanding why any signage would be necessary at all. And if the township does believe the signage is necessary, what is the reasoning behind posting it in every room of the dwelling? My suggestion would be that it be posted only where water is available, such as a bathroom or a kitchen. In terms of the license fee, while the township has provided demerit points and fine amounts, there is no information about the proposed license fee cost. Having that information would be helpful to determine if the township would be running at a deficit to run this program, and if so, by how much. Again, those are just a few comments that I have, but thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you very much, Amanda. Our next speaker is Sandra Wales. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. I live at 11571 Beach Road East in Waynefleet. Um, having looked at our neighborhood, I don't really see that short-term rentals are an issue for our area. And this seems to be a lot of regulation um, as far, that is put on the residents when it, in our area, I haven't seen it be an issue. I have four family members that have lived in the Wayne Fleet area for up to 20 years, and they have not seen this as an issue either. Uh, Lakeside expects um, vacationers to come and it helps to bring community income, uh, money to the restaurants, etc. cetera. Um, I read the draft by law and it seems to be very difficult for a general resident to comply with. Um, the document states all the restrictions and rules that residents need to comply, but it does not really give any um, responsibilities on the part of the municipality, such as how long it takes them to review and license. Um, it, it also needs to have incorporated a way that they would educate and support the residents in trying to comply with this. Um, in my experience over the last couple of years, of course there's COVID, but it's been very hard to get um, answers to some questions concerning permitting. And uh, lots of times phone calls are not returned, emails are not returned. And, and so it just puts an extra burden on the residents if they want to comply and try to comply with this if they can't get answers 
to their questions and make sure that they are in full compliance um, in order not to create any problems. Um, there's a few examples on the rules like the fire safety plan. Um, I researched that a bit and there's really not a template that other professionals uh, who manage properties know about. I didn't know how we would uh, comply with this or what would be considered a fire safety plan or if you're going to give us a template. Um, the bylaw refers to a fire safety inspection. And my question is, is the fire department prepared to handle this? Has this been thought through of what, what this means to the residents and also to the township management? Who issues the water report? Are they prepared to do this in a reasonable time? How often does this need to be done? Who is considered a qualified septic inspector? Is it the township building inspector? Is it someone else? Um, what is it supposed to include other than the septic tank functions? Um, how do you obtain, I have other questions like how do you obtain permission for the unit for a parking according to section 6.4 and 6.5? That's not clarified. And under administration 5.1 in the bylaw, what are the conditions that would cause the licensee not to be issued, revoked, or suspended? Um, I wasn't clear on that, uh, what the fee for the license is. I've not seen that. Page seven, section seven, is very vague as to license administration can require additional information. Well, what sort of ad additional information would that be? I feel like it has to be clear or it'd be very hard for residents to comply with this. Section 9.1 is also very vague and the demerit point system would be difficult to manage and comply with in my estimation. Section 14 on enforcement is vague and not clear how the inspection would be scheduled. And the penalty seem very high, even if you tried to comply with everything and maybe because something that you didn't understand, you weren't um, you didn't comply with, the penalty seems very high. In conclusion, I feel that this bylaw on short-term rentals is really not needed for the well-being of our uh, community. And it's written mainly from the view of the township with not a lot of input by residents as to what is practical. Um, thanks so much for listening to my opinions. Thank you very much, Sandra. Our next speaker is uh, Rico Leon. Uh, thank you. Um, good evening. Um, my name is Rico Leon, and along with my wife Florence, uh, we live at uh, 10341 Lakeshore Road. We reviewed the bylaws presented uh, to govern the short-term rental properties in Waynefleet and are offering the following. It seems uh, the intent of the bylaws is to license the owners of STRs and have them continue to operate in residential zones. Many of the bylaws address infractions and penalties for the infractions. However, there is nothing there to stop the STRs from operating in a residential zone. Imagine this, living next door to a house where you have eight to 10 new neighbors every two or three days. The renters move in around 3 p.m., party on the beach that evening into the early morning, resume the partying the following afternoon, into the evening and early morning, and they are gone by noon the following day. The cleaning crew comes in, cleans up the place, and it starts all over again. That is what we and other residents of Lakeshore experience from Victoria Day to Thanksgiving Day. It has been said that STRs bring tourist dollars into the community that supports the local economy. I can tell you firsthand that this is not the case. Absolutely not. I have watched the tenants move in, unload their people, oh, <clears throat> excuse me, unload their beer coolers, their food, their beach umbrellas canopy and chairs, boombox, and other beach toys. They're here to drink, play loud music, 
and party for two or three days. They don't have time to do any shopping locally or any sightseeing. I've had to take my grandchildren into the house to shelter them from the F-bombs that were being hurled. They contribute, the, the, they don't contribute anything positive uh, to the community except for heartaches for the neighboring residents. Are these people, are these the people you want as neighbors? First and foremost, we must resolve if short-term rentals are a commercial operation or not. If one is renting accommodations for profit, like a hotel or a motel, then we believe that it's a, uh, definitely a commercial venture. Ms. Lindsay stated at the council meeting when these bylaws were presented that many times the owners are from outside the area and they have an agent managing their STRs. To me, this implies that it's a commercial operation. That being the case, <clears throat> the present draft bylaws are legitimizing the operation of a commercial venture in a residential zone. They are making a, a non-conforming business in a residential zone conforming at the expense of the present conforming property owners. The properties and rights of the present property owners cannot be overlooked and must be protected. And their property is not devalued due to the operation of short term rentals next door. The Webster's Dictionary defines residence as, and I quote, the place where one actually lives uh, as distinguished from one's domicile or a place of temporary sojourn, hence the term residential zone. It seems, or it establishes a community where people live and not stay. Remember, live and not stay. Under normal circumstances, if I wanted to operate a commercial venture on my residential property, I would have to apply for a zoning change and go through all the vetting before the zoning change is granted or denied. Therefore, if STR owners wish to operate in a residential area, they need to follow the same protocols as all leaders have to follow. They need to apply for a zoning change. When we built our home over 30 years ago, all the properties around us were zoned residential and the homes were inhabited by the owners and their families. They are the people who support and send their children to the local schools, attend the local churches, support our hardware store, hairdresser, bakery, restaurant, garden center, farmer's market, food drives, and so on. Today, of the 13 homes within 200 meters of our home, there are five STRs operated by absentee landlords. This change occurred in the last five years. I would venture to say, as soon as one, one of these owner-occupied homes comes up for sale, it will be turned into a short-term rental by the new absentee owner. What will Wayne Fleet look like 10, 15, 20 years from today? Will Wayne Fleet have a school, a community center, a farmer's market? Can you see the deterioration of the community fabric? There is only one way to stop this, make it a requirement that the short-term rental property must, must be the owner's primary residence. This keeps the house a residence where people live, not stay, and thus conforms with the residential neighborhood. The owner can rent up to three rooms to supplement their income, and there is no rowdy parties every two or three days this bylaw has been implemented by many communities such as the town of Pelham, the city of St. Catharines, the town of Collingwood, the town of Wasega Beach, and the city of Toronto, and many others. As leaders of the community, you have a difficult decision to make. You need to decide whether the town of Wayne Fleet is a resident friendly community, a community whose residents look after their neighbors, are active in the community function, in community functions, 
support locally owned businesses, contribute to food drives, and their children attend local schools. Or a community that is dark in the winter months and party central in the summer months, all orchestrated by absentee landlords who collect rents from outside the community, spend it in the outside, in their own community, sorry, spend it in their own community in which they live and contribute absolutely nothing to the town of Wainfleet. Which community do you want to govern? In closing, we trust that council and staff will enact bylaws that protect the rights and sanctity of the current and future residents of Wainfleet, as other communities have done, and not the selfless wants of absentee landlords. It must be a requirement that STRs is the owner's primary residence. This, is, this would be the right thing to do. Thank you for the opportunity to be heard, and we look forward to a timely and favorable resolution. Thank you. Thank you, Rico, for your comments. Our next speaker is Shelly Ann. Shelly Ann, if you want to turn on your microphone and camera. Hi, all. My name is Shelly Ann Remlochen of 11267 Harborview Road in Wayne Fleet. Um, I just learned uh, about the bylaws and I was given the opportunity to review them last week. Uh, I want to just say uh, thank you for council members on their work in preparing these bylaws. Um, I think that it is a great opportunity for hosts like myself um, to see what is required from the township. Um, but I call myself a host. That's um, that's what it is. It's six to eight weeks in a year that I offer my off offer the property up for rent uh, to offset the cost of my family's cottage. Um, with COVID, uh, we haven't been able to enjoy it as much as we would like, uh, primarily because of restrictions and movement uh, placed on us by the government. Um, so, what I'm seeing in this bylaw is. Uh, information such uh, like a, an opportunity to gather information for, uh, on behalf of the township. So they're looking to know who owns these properties, how can they be reached, um, and just so they can uh, create a record, a record holding system, uh, which I think is going to be great uh, for everyone. Um, it also gives us some outlines in regards to what information you want displayed, uh, which can definitely be accommodated. Uh, perhaps we can go back to um, Amanda Marshall's point about uh, where it's displayed and the distances and things like that. I do find the wording and definitions to be very restrictive um, in that uh, regards to the total number of people be two per bedroom. I think it should be more in line with regions like Niagara Falls, where they indicate maximum occupancy as determined by the chief building official. I think that uh, that wording speaks well because then that is someone coming from outside the community and determining what is appropriate for the size and scale of a particular property. Um, also, we have um, the wording for the license administrator for them to um, the wording around their powers is what uh, uh, <laughs> caught me off guard because <clears throat> it says what as the license administrator considers appropriate in the circumstances. Um, because this is something new, I would like to know what those circumstances look like and what those penalties uh, will look like um, before I decide to continue to, to rent out my property. Um, the penalties that are indicated by the township are much more than uh, the neighboring regions, such as uh, Fort Erie, they have a registration fee of 500 St. Catharines, um, their registration fee is none. There's just penalties uh, should the registration lapse. Um, but for our town, because it, uh, of the size and scale of it, um, I guess that's why they're asking for 1500 because it will maybe create a new position. Because uh, this licensed administrator, I wanted to know, um, does this person have um, an existing title uh, working within um, the town? Uh, do they already have a position and they'll be adding this under that? Or is this a new position being created just to monitor, the, uh, as she said, the, about 120 or so uh, units? Because that can be expensive in a year's time, especially since we already have a bylaws and we have bylaw officers um, that will really be the ones still putting in majority of the work here. So I wonder, um, 
what the this document is supposed to do uh, when we already have noise and nuisance control bylaws. If it's about um, to monitor the properties, um, we have that ability already. So the other questions that I have um, for the fire plan inspection and boil water advisory, uh, my property uh, specifically has um, a, a water system. Uh, so a boil water advisory wouldn't really be applicable because of the system that we have in the home. Uh, and I would like to discuss um, if that's something we have to prove on an ongoing basis or if it's something that we would have to show documentation for uh, at one point. Um, also in regards to the septic system, perhaps we can indicate that the septic before each new licensing uh, be cleaned, right? Because an inspection for me is kind of a waste of money. I'd prefer to just pay to have the septic cleaned out um, annually or every two years per whatever the licensing may be, um, as opposed for me to spend money on that and spend money on that. Perhaps I can alleviate that with that one um, uh, a bill, um, transaction. Um, also, I just wanted to speak to some of the comments being made here. Um, so this is not an accommodation for profit. Uh, I don't know um, if majority of the ones are, because my understanding is a lot, I've been speaking to a number of other hosts and uh, majority of them, it's more about offsetting the costs for themselves and for their families uh, to be able to enjoy something that um, unfortunately, I don't have the opportunity to live in Waynefleet uh, on a permanent basis uh, because of work. Um, but I love the town. That's why I chose for it to be the place in which my children will spend their summers, um, for my mom to spend majority of her winters. Uh, so I, I apologize to anyone that has um, felt as though this is a personal wrong uh, by us leasing these properties out, but it's nothing personal. Um, also, in regards to it being deemed commercial uh, for commercial usage, I thought that... Um, I've looked into that and there's a local planning appeal tribunal with the with Ontario and they would be the ones that would consider things like this because right now Airbnbs are not considered commercial use spaces um, and that would have to be made on a greater level outside of us here in this conversation today was my understanding. Um, so uh, again, I, I feel like we need some more time. We need to have an opportunity to have more community members and stakeholders as there are 49 people on the call today um, uh, and 120 some odd hosts um, that should have input on something like this, on such an important document. Um, I would ask that this be given more time so we can reflect it and uh, maybe look into what other jurisdictions are doing as well. Uh, that would be amazing. Thank you all for your time. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is John Doplin. Hi, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Do you have yes, your sorry, camera available? Um, oh, hang on a second. Okay, there we go. Can you see me now? Yes, we can see you. Okay, Thank hi. You. My, my name is Leslie Dodlin, and my spouse, John Dodlin from 11263, was going to speak. However, he's got a sore throat from being out snow blowing yesterday in the uh, inclement weather. So, um, Thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to discuss the short term rental uh, draft bylaw that has been uh, formulated at the township. Um, first and foremost, we want to acknowledge that the township already has within its official plan for the regulation of bed and breakfast within Wayne Fleet um, limits on the number of bedrooms. So they are limited to a three bedroom uh, property and the owner has to be on site. Short term rentals um, certainly don't normally have the owners on site. It sort of is very, um, very different from what the whole Airbnb short term rental premise really was, where you would be in your home and you would give somebody a spot on your floor or your couch. But what's happened is it's morphed into these ghost hotels um, for many neighborhoods. That is what the experience has become. Um, so 
in reviewing the draft bylaw, we did find that there were some areas where we felt some improvement needed to be made. Um, and one of the big issues would be that the short-term rental would only be used by people who are living at that primary residence. So the primary residence would be the short-term rental. And currently to date, we know that many of the um, short-term rental owners are not living within the community of Wayne Fleet. They may pay their taxes here, but that's um, probably the most that they're really contributing to our community. So recognizing that probably it being your primary residence isn't going to be an option, we believe that um, we need to have limits. We need to limit the number of bedrooms, much akin to what is already in place for the bed and breakfast in Wayne Fleet. There should be a maximum of three bedrooms to a short-term rental. Um, the number of bedrooms most certainly should be in line with what MPAC has listed. Um, and also that would sort of uh, encapsulate septic systems, what your septic was designed for. Um, we also believe that limits need to be set on the number of occupants um, because without having a limit on the number of occupants, a limit on the number of bedrooms, and a limit to the number of guests, uh, non-paying guests that the renters can invite over, we've really got a very unenforceable draft bylaw. So we've also sort of looked at the idea that the um, short-term rental, some of them really don't fit the characteristic of the neighborhood. Our um, area does have some short-term rentals, um, within the area, some are very small and some are very large. To date, one of the rentals in the area uh, currently, as of this morning, advertises on their listing that it is a home suitable for events and can accommodate a gathering of 25 or more guests. And that is actually what has been transpiring. Um, you know, we had large parties going on within the neighborhood. These parties didn't end at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, um, which is also why we believe it would be very important for the bylaw to contain an aspect where the hours when the non-paying guests um, have to leave the premises. We need to be able to have no noise from hot tubs, swimming pools, after 10 p.m. at night. If you look at most hotels, they don't allow the guests at a hotel to use swimming pools. There are a lot of liabilities in that. Um, so that, that is one thing that we think is very important. Um, so really, if we don't have any limits on occupancy, limits on bedrooms, limits on the guests, limits on when those guests have to leave, then we don't limit the problems. But if you limit the bedrooms, limit the occupants, limit the guests, limit the times, then you're going to limit the problems and that becomes way less work for bylaw, way less work for the Niagara Regional Police, and way less work for the township. Um, so we um, really think that there are some good aspects to the draft, but there were a lot of areas where we thought, um, you know, we could have some improvement. There are a lot of unscrupulous owners who will skirt, um, skirt things. They will lie. You know, we, we can't trust these owners to be upfront and genuine when in fact, sometimes we know they're very disingenuous. So, um, you know, we've got to rely on the township to have that firm bylaw in place. Uh, and we think that being proactive rather than reactive is probably going to cost Wayne Fleet a lot less uh, financially um, when you look at the, the workforce, that sort of thing. We think it would really ease the burden on the township. Um, we also believe that um, having a two-year license granted to some unscrupulous ghost hotel landlords is two years too long. And when you're living in the vicinity of a party hotel, one year is bad enough, two years is even worse. And, you know, 
there were even aspects in that draft bylaw where things just didn't jive. A two-year license um, when the person's only having to show their insurance. Insurance comes up every year. So there were these small aspects that we thought you could really improve. Um, we think that we, we need to be able to say that, does this party house suit the neighborhood? Does it fit in the neighborhood? Are you changing the characteristic of the neighborhood? Have people been able to start a business, a full-time business? Places near us were rented all summer. All summer long, the traffic was in and out. If it was the month of July, about 27 days, the property had renters. So, you know, this is a, a full-time business and these people are only paying residential taxes. They should be taxed as a business because they're running a business. If you're not living here full-time, then you're running a business here full-time. So, you know, Wayne Fleet could really um, probably make a little bit of money here. Um, you know, I think it would be a good thing for the community, but definitely um, some areas here in Wayne Fleet have lost the enjoyment of their property. Um, the fit, the characteristic of the neighborhood was changed without consultation with the township or the neighborhood. And, you know, it would just make really good sense to have some really good bylaws. And the time to do it is now rather than like Fort Erie. They've already worked their system for a year. They've already revamped their bylaws because they realized that there were too many loopholes and we don't need another Fort Erie. So um, in closing, we hope that the bylaws will limit the occupants, limit the bedrooms, limit the number of guests, limit the hours that those guests can party here, and then we're gonna be able to limit the problems. So thank you very much um, for having the opportunity to express our concerns. Thank you very much, Leslie. So our next speaker is Marion uh, Morrison. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank your worship and members of council and staff for allowing me to speak today. My name is Marion Morrison. I live at 11269 Harborview Road in Wayne Fleet. Harborview Road is a dead end street in a quiet residential neighborhood of single family dwellings with uh, approximately one to five occupants per household. Now, most of the people on this street are retirees. Uh, the property next door to me was purchased as an Airbnb in October 2020 by a property investor. The owner modified the formerly four bedroom house to sleep 15, essentially turning it into a multifamily dwelling or a hotel. The owner rented the house to capacity for most of the summer 2021, even when Ontario was in a lockdown, when indoor gatherings were restricted to just five people. Frequently, one group would be gone by 11 a.m., next would show up by 3 p.m. the same day. I did submit three separate bylaw complaints to the township during this time period to address the COVID violations, but the owner was never fined or charged because the uh, investigation wasn't completed until after the uh, Ontario was out of lockdown and due to the uh, bylaw officer's workload. So um, I'm just, I'm citing that as an example of what happens when a uh, neighborhood is, is uh, you know, changed by a large house uh, being rented out. Um, basically, I and my neighbors have lost all of our privacy. We've experienced sexual harassment, public drunkenness, public urination, profanity, loud yelling and screaming, hot tub parties late into the night, careless use of fireworks, loud music all day, barking dogs running loose and being constantly watched by strangers. Um, most of the renters are from the, GT, the greater Toronto area. So none of them have any attachment to the community. Um, I kind of, I agree with uh, Rico's comments that these people don't come here to spend money in our community. They come here to party. The, the comments about the cases of beer and liquor and their lawn chairs and it is constant all day parties and music. The sheer numbers of people staying at this house and the party atmosphere simply do not fit the character and the quality of this residential single family dwelling neighborhood. Um, and myself, I've been forced to erect no trespassing signs to allow me a small measure of privacy on my beachfront, which was taken over on more than one occasion by people staying at this house. 
Um, and I, I'm still, when I go down to the water to have a swim, I'm in view of strangers all the time. Uh, when I'm out on my deck or, or, at, uh, or going on my paddleboard, I am always in view of strangers. I recently installed security cameras and expense that I really can't afford, but I had to, to protect my personal safety and to have a mechanism in place to afford the renters who have been trespassing on my property. If we have to allow short-term rentals to operate in the residential neighborhood, then we have to limit it to eight occupants on the premises at any given time. And that includes non-paying or non-registered guests or visitors. So if there's six renters, there can't be any more than two visitors or four renters, four visitors and so on. If there's nothing specific in the bylaw to address maximum numbers allowed to be in the house and on the premises, there will be nothing enforceable if the renters decide to host a large party or to circumvent the maximum number of paying guests and allow more than eight people to stay there. Um, On-street parking has been mentioned and yes, it, it was an issue. Um, in October, there was a large wedding party. There on, uh, in the morning during the day, there were 25 to 30 vehicles lining the street, blocking the flow of two-way traffic. I called bylaw, but was told nothing could be done because our street is not included in the township parking bylaw. Um, so overflow on street parking needs to be addressed within the STR bylaw, as in other communities with bylaws in place, the owner must provide one parking spot per bedroom with no on street parking permitted and failure to comply has to be included in the demerit point schedule. This will allow for traffic to flow safely with no disrupt disruptions for the permanent residents. Additionally, I, I think the proposed 180 day rental period, that's pretty much the entire cottage season doesn't leave much time for the permanent residents to enjoy their own properties without the constant turnover of renters and strangers next door or within the neighborhood. Could the number be scaled back to 120 or even 90 days? Um, and this would still allow for ample rental income and, and uh, lets the permanent residents enjoy at least some of the summer in peace. Um, and the other uh, concerns are um, with the current draft bylaw, um, it refers to the already existing bylaws for noise, nuisance, fireworks, et cetera, which uh, my own experience have been very hard to get enforced. So I would suggest that there needs to be a clause that holds the property owner directly responsible for any guests, um, including the non-paying visitors for behavior that is offensive, vexatious, intimidating, or harassing toward neighbors. Uh, I, I believe the comments have been made about profanity. Yes, I had to put up with that. I have elderly relatives that were here that were quite offended by some of the language going on next door, but I am not in a position to have to go and um, intervene all the time. I shouldn't have to do that on my own property. Um, so I do, I, I uh, ask members of council, put yourself, yourself in my shoes and think about how it would be if you had to experience a complete loss of privacy and safety in your own home, just because of a constant flow of strangers renting next door. In, if the bylaw that is currently being drafted or the draft is enacted as it is, there's gonna be a sharp increase in complaint driven enforcement because it's too vague and incomplete. The onus should not fall to the permanent residents to police their own neighborhoods and subsequently become the problem. Cause that's what I feel like when I've called and I'm not getting any help from bylaw, I feel like I'm starting to be the problem and it should not be that way. Um, so a few additions and, uh, and a little bit more research will, um, it will probably help make the bylaw a little more effective. I do want to commend council and staff for their uh, seeing that this, we do need to enact some leg legislation, but we do need a lot more work. The burden and impact of property investors seeking financial gains should definitely not be permitted to overshadow the rights of permanent residents and taxpayers to enjoy their homes. And that is what I have seen happen here. And I have um, anybody who lives on my street knows what I have endured and it can affect any of us at any given time. We should not be giving over to people who are strictly doing this for an investment. And that is what the, the house next door to me has been. I thank everybody for um, the time to uh, say my piece and I suspect my five minutes is long ago over. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marianne. Our next speaker is Tracy, Tracy Hoare. Hi there. Um, thank you for um, giving me the opportunity as well to provide some feedback. Um, my name is Tracy Orr and we have a cottage at 11144 Churchill Avenue. Uh, we live in Hamilton full time. Um, just a little bit of a background. We, uh, my husband and I purchased our cottage, uh, a little 440 square feet. 
uh, as a seasonal getaway uh, back about 20 years ago. So a lot of things have changed. Um, owners have changed. The neighborhood has changed. That's, that's the way things go. Um, in our area, we have a lot of Americans, so they haven't been there the past couple of years. We've pitched in, we've helped cut grass, we've trimmed trees. That's just what you do as, as good neighbors. Um, through personal ups and downs, financially, et cetera, the, the cottage and the lake have always been our escape. I, I just, I love the water. Um, in uh, 2020, uh, my husband at 49 years old had a stroke. Um, he hasn't been able to work the last year and a half, and we don't know when he will be able to work. Uh, we have two kids in university, as well as mortgages, uh, a lot of expenses. Um, so as a way to keep our cottage and be able to uh, maintain it, help pay um, expenses, um, we decided at the end of last year to uh, rent it out when we're not using it. This isn't a business for us. Um, we didn't just purchase this. We've owned this for 20 years. We love the area. We don't take for granted any of it. Um, the lake, the natural beauty, you know, this, we do our groceries in town. We buy our wine at the store. We do, you know, pay for our gas. Um, this is something that we do so we can hold on to this place and, and hopefully, you know, enjoy it for many years to come. Um, I can't stress the uh, emotional, stressful, and of course, financial burden that the proposed licensing process, the permit fees um, will put on us and our family. Um, and not to mention um, the logistics of the timelines on um, all of the inspections and being able to line everything up. Um, my husband um, actually is a uh, electrician. He did call the electrical safety authority, who would be the ones doing electrical inspections, uh, just to inquire about the fees. Um, and we understand that there should be some limitations or regulations, um, but they, they need to be within reason. Um, when he did call about the fees involved in having inspection done, he was told that they have not done these in the last two years due to COVID, and they don't know when they'll be doing inspections again. So this is not new building inspections, this is for existing. Um, so a concern that we have is how will we as owners be able to prepare for applying for licenses um, for, as you say, you know, at least 100 home or 100 cottages that will be rented uh, when it's very limited resources, very limited people able to do the inspections. Um, as uh, short-term rental providers, we do uh, rent through Airbnb, but we hold our cottage up to the highest standards possible. We get rated on our property. We rate the renters. Um, everything gets rated from inside and out. I limit the cottage. It's 440 square feet, four renters. That's it. Um, we're we reiterate that, you know, before they even booking, I advertise it as a quiet family rental. So I don't think that every Airbnb or every rental property can be lumped into the same as people renting out for 20 people. That's just, it's not realistic. Our neighborhood is, is quiet. It's 90% cottages. It's not a uh, full-time residence, but we've had no complaints. Um, we, we, on the flip side of that, we've had a big changeover, as I mentioned, and we do have a lot of younger neighbors that own their cottage now. They have parties, they have boat trailers, they have RVs. It's part of being in a community. Um, we do have bylaws currently in place and we have them to regulate noise. We have them to regulate parking. Um, I'm not sure how the township will be able to do anything more because you're renting, then the, the police will be able to. Um, it's been mentioned in um, the township's uh, previous meetings, the uh, admin report, um, that uh, under, it's understood that some concerns have been raised with respect to short-term rentals and activities. However, the township staff have received very few formal written complaints to date with respect to short-term rentals in the township. So I think we have to look at this on proportion of how many um, unfortunate incidences there are out of the hundred or so rentals that are doing everything they can uh, to comply and be good neighbors. Um, there are also um, financial uh, considerations that were mentioned in um, 
from the from the township in the planning staff report from October 26th that the fees alone are not going to be enough uh, to monitor and regulate the program. So how are these going to be paid for? Are property taxes going to be increased? Um, there was also another. Um, they mentioned the more specific costing impl implications will need to be reviewed along with a recommended fee schedule for the license applications. When will this happen? Let's see. So I just summarize, um, you know, for us, the short-term rentals has enabled us to not only maintain the property, but also continue to upgrade it. Um, we do recommend uh, local restaurants, we tell people where the grocery stores are. There is definitely more business being had um, by having people come in. Um, a couple of things that we just wanted to mention, um, section 436, um, whereas municipality uh, bylaws providing that the municipal may enter onto any land at a reasonable time for the purpose of carrying out an inspection to determine compliance with the bylaw direction order or condition of a license. Um, that seems incredibly vague that at any time, um, as cottage owners anyway, we are not always there, let alone an inspection to take place. Um, and also, um, I believe that there was a two hour um, on section 12.1 H licensees shall ensure that the licensee or the agent is available to attend at the short term rental unit within a period of no more than two hours after being contacted by phone or email. Well, some of us work, some of us don't drive. So I just think that two hour window is absolutely unreasonable. Um, we're always available by phone and um, you know, definitely want to want to take care of everything. Um, so I just I'm just going to summarize to that. Keep in mind that the majority of us that render cottages are families. We work extremely hard um, to be able to hold on to what I call our happy place. And I'd like for our opinions and input to have just as much impact um, in the decisions that are being made as um, residents that live there full time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tracy. Our next speaker is Joseph Sandelli. Okay, we can hear and see you, so you can go ahead. Okay, thank you. I, I uh, Initially, I did not uh, put myself down as a speaker. I was going to be just a participant, but uh, having viewed uh, what's transpired today so far, um, I would like to maybe have a few words to say. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Council for allowing us this uh, opportunity to uh, express ourselves. Uh, first of all, uh, I and having listened to some of these comments, I, I take uh, uh, with, with a great amount of uh, order here, listening to some of the folks that have really uh, experienced very negative uh, uh, situations with regard to people who have SDRs uh, next to them. I presented to Wayne Fleet uh, a letter. I'm sorry that uh, my technical ability didn't allow me to copy it, so I couldn't read it here today. But in any event, the bottom line of it was that uh, I see that uh, going back in 2010, Wingfleet uh, basically had a, an official plan produced and, and uh, at great expense, legal expense and time for this, which was to run, run from 2010, 2010 to 2030. And basically, I'm not going to go through the whole thing. Of course, it was 116 or 17 pages, but they started off in many areas for the most part, and I'll just go over the short term uh, silly area, areas that I thought affected me. They, they wanted in this particular official plan was to maintain a small village character and the protection of agricultural lands and lifestyle. 
And it mentions again, they, they wanted to in Wainfleet to build a, on its rural character and its peaceful, safe, and quiet environment. And once again, they, they state, once again, they, they want to have uh, Wainfleet, the rural lifestyle will be so uh, celebrated and there'll be a strong sense of community uh, and fostering a good fellowship among the neighbors. Uh, it goes on again uh, several other times talking about the lifestyle, the quietness, the peacefulness, the, the uh, privacy. This was all basically put in order, more or less to be followed up uh, for the next 20 years. Now, it, it appears to me that uh, even though this, uh, this outline has been, was presented uh, or drawn up, the, the, uh, with, with the advent of the STRs, and they may be more new to this area than they have been in other areas, but what's happening now, we're, we're beginning to have a situation where in, in certain areas of certain folks, uh, the lifestyle has not been in a peaceful, quiet, and private or, or safe. Uh, and what's happened, uh, so the city has come along, or I should say the community has come along and drawn up bylaws to try to, at the, at the request of citizens that are around here right now that ask for this. I've looked at them. Um, I, I think that for the most part, they were, you know, they're, 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 ba they're basically legalized boilerplate. They don't really get right down to the nitty gritty. And the bottom line of it is that having condensed this all out, Toronto, for the most part, has been dealing with this problem for many, many, many years. And they basically formulated extremely uh, strong bylaws fairly recently to, uh, I would say combat uh, STRs. I mean, and I'm not gonna go through what they stated because I don't have them all here right now, but I would say that I would say for Wainfleet Council to go and check these out. And, and I would think that they would be best used because a couple of the main points was that these uh, STR residences should be the primary resident of the person who is renting. I mean, we allowed to have bed and breakfast here. And the main idea of the bed and breakfast was the owner was there and he controlled what was happening on his or her property. And this is not what is happening. I mean, I observed it the last two, two years. I mean, and it, it, it's not an over-exaggeration for me to say, I saw 16 people in a house a couple doors west of us, uh, you know, in the early part of the year. That was the first time. I mean, they're contravening uh, the Department of Health issues with regard to COVID. They're, 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 they're all this stuff with noise and against, again, parties, et cetera. There's no respect for the people who live next door. And I, I think that that is, when you start paying the, the amount of taxes that we're paying, that there should be some level of, of, of care taken. And I know that, and people have said they call the bylaw officer. Well, he's not, he's not working on the weekends or it's very difficult to get him. So how do you control something like that? Once again, I think basically the bottom line is you have to look at the, the bylaws put forth by Toronto and maybe enact some of those or most of those. And I, I also in closing would say, uh, and I point this to the uh, council, you know, as leaders of the community, uh, are you going to be the ones that are going to be the ones that uh, will be going against the Wayne Fleet official plan and allow these profit making goes to hotels with minimal bylaws, which cannot be enforced with an end result of a negative living standard for the people who are full time residents. One of the other things that's happened here, and this is an unfortunate thing because a lot of people aren't even aware that this meeting is being taken place right now. You have this large contingent of Americans that they have no say, they're not here, they don't even know about this. And as a result of this, I, I think I would really hope that this is not going to be the end of the input because these folks have to have their say as well. And uh, with that, I, I'd like to close. Uh, I would hope that possibly we would have a chance to maybe uh, voice uh, our opinion at another point when we come up with what Wayne Flight has decided to come up with. Uh, I thank you. Thank you very much, Joseph. Our next speaker is Claudia Langman. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Do you have access to a camera? I do. I had eye surgery this morning, unfortunately. 
So <laughs> no I, look like, I look like a mummy. So I think I'm just going to pass on you okay. viewing this uh, on a <laughs> unattractive look. Okay, um, no problem. We can hear you. <laughs> okay. I have been living in Sunset Bay. I am an American, but my family has owned a cottage there since I was um, 13 years old. And I'm now in my 60s, and I see both sides of the problem. I, I think the main issue is that a lot of people, um, as Airbnb owners, don't regulate and don't have um, rules in place that renters have to sign that control this situation. Um, I have done, done, I have another Airbnb in the States, and I have never had these issues and I started renting probably 20 years ago. A lot of it has to do with the owner putting in restrictions and having these renters sign um, certain rules that they have to follow with the understanding that if they don't, they have to leave. They can't be there. And it, it's a complicated issue. I see both sides of it. I understand that it, it's awful if you have a cottage and somebody next door is not regulating who comes in and out of their house and you have to put up with it. It's just wrong. I think there's probably a better way to approach this to stop that situation, which by the way, I have not had. And to try to be a good neighbor, but at the same time, not unduly punish people who do need that additional income in order to keep their home. And that's my situation. So I don't, we don't rent it out very often. Um, and we, now we've reached a point where people who do rent from us are friends, you know, people who come back every year. Um, and my thought was one thing that I could do that might be helpful is to send the town the agreement that renters have to sign because there's a lot of in of there's a lot in it that helps avoid these situations um and just clarifies it and maybe what the town needs is to um, review something like that and have certain parts of it put in place to prevent a problem where people are overloading the house letting people party you know, disturbing the neighbors, you know, it's not right. And it, but the, my concern is that that won't be taken into consideration. And suddenly, you know, we're throwing out the baby with the bathwater. And I just don't think that fair, that's fair. I think there needs to be a middle ground. I'm hoping, I'm asking that this decision does not get made in a hurry. If I had not been notified by someone on Facebook, I wouldn't even know this meeting was happening. So, you know, I, I think it's really important to limit the number of cars they can have on the property, the number of people that can be in the home. Uh, there needs to be a noise ordinance so that they cannot be partying outside around a bonfire past 10 o'clock at night. There are many ways to control this. And I just feel like if you don't, if you've not done it before, you need someone to have some input as to how to make this a more livable situation for everyone. So I don't, you know, like that, for example, I noticed there was this potable water sign that was supposed to be posted in every bedroom, which, you know, it, it seems absurd to me and I'm not even sure why it's there. I mean, we're on a cistern. Our water is clean. I don't understand what that's for. And in terms of these fire inspections, I don't think we have a fire inspections for people who don't run out their homes. I don't see what the difference is. So I would love to have some input into maybe trying to make this ordinance more reasonable and not cause a hardship who, who uh, for people who do need to rent, not full-time, but need to rent to help supplement the cost of owning the cottage. So I don't know if that's a possibility. I'm hoping that it is. I'm asking that we give this a little more time to try to make it reasonable for everyone. I mean, no one wants their neighbor to have to put up with 
parties and large groups of people parking cars that's just not right either so i'm hoping that we can try to table this for a month or two and get a little more input and get it to be a more just a simple but helpful ordinance right now when i read it there are parts of it that i don't even know why they're in there i don't know how they're helping anybody so that's my request is that we do that and not make it a hardship for the people who do need to do supplemental income in order to keep their cottage but also protect the neighbors i i, I see both sides of it so that's my re my really strong request is that we take a look at you know like i have people sign an agreement they have to sign it before they even get a access to the house um and i think that's probably the best way to do this is to make sure that there are some restrictions put into an agreement that any airbnb or short-term rental person needs to have and it's a way to solve a lot of this problem so I think that's the main thing I wanted to say. Okay, thank you very much for your comments, Claudia. Our next uh, registered speaker is Mark Turner. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm gonna keep my comments brief. I live at 11161 Churchill Avenue and I have been here for 12 years. I moved here from Font Hill. And when I moved here, I moved for the peace and quiet of living on the lake. This mostly uh, community with an association was families and uh, seasonal cottages and has now been disintegrating into B&Bs with no regulation, with absentee owners, that don't audit their short-term rentals. I'm in agreement with, um, let me just repeat the uh, names because I don't want to go on and, and repeat all the things that have been said as was indicated in the opening statements, but I agree totally with uh, Rico Leon, Leslie and uh, Marion Morrison that you know the owners would love to just increase the number of renters per bedroom from two to three to four. But I have had as many as six people renting in a two bedroom cottage and then six guests over a weekend. And you can only imagine what that has turned into with dogs, four dogs. Uh, another issue that hasn't been addressed with uh, the number of animals that are permitted on a property. I can't seem to walk in my yard without a dog barking at me or running loose. There's total disregard for our leash laws. And uh, also with the, if I may say, poop bags, I'm constantly shoveling poop off my property. I've had to put up a no trespassing sign on my property. I feel like I'm a, a policeman. I don't see anybody auditing their properties that they rent out to, which is a big problem for me. There's garbage all over the yard being blown. They just, uh, you know, they rent one day, two days, and they leave the garbage on their patio or, uh, you know, and I don't want to go on all about this, but I think that the council is in the right direction in drafting this first set of bylaws. I don't think that two people per bedroom is, is uh, unacceptable. And in fact, I think they need to take it a step further with no visitors allowed. You know, these uh, I've heard from Amanda, who has a, a number of uh, of uh, of uh, rental units all across uh, Fort Erie and Waynefleet and Port Colburn, and uh, how we should increase the number of uh, renters per bedroom. But I never heard her mention the the septic tank uh, permits and how they're grandfathered in, and how you know when you have let's say twelve people. Uh, in a in a weekend cottage of two bedrooms and how that's affecting that septic bed. And then I read in the Niagara News that uh, that most of the beaches around here are closed. 
and I'm wondering how that's being addressed by council. But uh, that being said, I I, uh, um, I do commend the council for taking this first step and allowing us to speak and giving us our feedback. And again, I don't want to beat a dead horse. Um, I'm living next door to a B and B, and I'm feeling like a prisoner ever since uh, that was purchased and turned into a B and B. Uh, and there have been some good guests, but honestly, the it, it's not audited, and uh, the most, the majority of those guests are not courteous. They trespass. They they make noise. Uh, they you know living on the lake, we don't have fences in between the properties. And of course, they crisscross playing sports, and I'm tired of looking at it out uh, on my lakefront. And I'm wondering at some point why I moved here from Font Hill, which was a nice community, to Waynefleet. And I'm wondering what's what the direction is the, that the council will take to uh, to help regulate this even further. I think this is a good first step, but I I think there needs to be even more regulation. The owners. Uh, from you know, and I'm talking about owners that have uh, several uh, being um, short-term rentals, don't seem to take to take that responsibility of uh, being courteous towards the the permanent residents living next to those properties. They give them a key, and and that's the end of it. They don't come over and check on them, whether they sign an agreement on the rules and regulations for that property. There's <laughs> Those, those people that are renting don't seem to abide by, by any of those rules. Anyway, that being said, um, I commend the council for the, uh, the first steps that they're taking towards these rules and regulations. And I, I hope that they will take it even further. And, uh, and I thank you for the time to speak. Thank you, Mark, for your comments. Um, so that was the, um, the remainder of the list of registered speakers. However, Mayor Gibson would like to say a few words. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, first, I'd like to say thank you to Lindsay and Sarah for uh, working away at this uh, bylaw as, as we are building it. And I would really like to thank everybody who's joined us today. Um, a lot of very good uh, points and information has been uh, forwarded. I think you'll see the complexity of this issue. It was count, in fact council who brought this forward and started, uh, excuse me, saying that we needed a bylaw to address this issue because we were hearing that it was an issue. So we have been working away at that and uh, we're, we're pretty confident we're gonna come up with something uh, very, very good for everyone. You can see the complexity of this we have people who live in Hamilton, for example, as the one speaker. Uh, they rent their cottage. Um, if it's not a problem, they rent it to four people. It's a family type situation. I know personally of other ones like that. We do not want to impact those negatively. If there's not a problem. Why do we want to make a, a problem there? But more than anything, we need to respect the people who live here, the residents who live here and uh, live next door to these party houses or very close. Uh, I think every councillor would probably say that, you know, we would not want to live next door to one of these. And so it's not right for anyone else to have to live next door to one of these big party houses. So the process is, is this is part of the process. Uh, thank you everyone for participating. We're gonna take all the comments. We're gonna work on it. Uh, we'll make some uh, changes to our draft bylaw. The council will have a look at it, review it, and then there may be more changes. Uh, I'm hoping by um, early spring that our bylaw is enacted uh, and we're moving forward and we can start to put a, a stop to these problem places. Remember, um, the first bylaw, as somebody spoke earlier, I think about Fort Erie, that they had it work for a year and then they already found that they had to make changes so it will probably take a little bit to get it uh, tuned right in so it's working perfectly but it is very important we keep Wayne Fleet Wayne Fleet we keep it you know quiet residential or country depending where you are and that um, everybody's rights are respected including the people who rent out their properties but in the end it has to work for everybody so 
Uh, I just want to say thank you to everybody for um, attending today. Uh, if you know people, um, as a couple people said, uh, perhaps a lot of people didn't know about it. Um, get the word out to people. It's been on our website. We've published it and, and that. So if you can get the word out to other people about this issue, I think uh, we can hear from you up until the end of January. We're taking input still. So please send us emails. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. And I uh, really, really appreciate your input. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Gibson. So I have in closing just uh, another slides that I wanted to share. Of course. Give me one second. So the next steps, we did want to thank all of the comments uh, for all the comments that have been provided today. As I mentioned, there are no recommendations provided by staff to council and council is not making any decisions today. Members of council are in attendance and have been listening intently as this experience will aid in their decision making at a later time. Going forward, the commenting period will remain open until Friday, February 4th for the public to submit their written comments through our website. Following a full review of all public comments received, a recommendation report will be prepared by staff and presented at subsequent meetings of Township Council. This will include any revisions to the draft bylaw as necessary. It'll include new application forms as well as fee schedules for the license applications and implementation of the program. If you have any further questions or if you wish to be notified when the recommendation report will be brought forward for Council's consideration, you can please make a written request to myself, uh, Lindsay Earl at learl at weanfleet.ca and I'd be happy to assist you. So that closes off uh, our meeting today. I'd like to thank you all again for your attendance. We've re received some great feedback as well as a number of responses via written submissions to date. So this concludes the virtual open house meeting. I wish you all a lovely evening. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay.